You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for May 22nd, 2020. It's not safe for work. Coming to you live from the Cornfield Resistance, where it's the last day of school, or maybe it's Halloween, or maybe it's 2021. We don't know anymore. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Well, I know it's not 2021, Drift Glass. You're sure? You're absolutely sure yeah. about that. You okay. can tell from my blood pressure it's not 2021 that's yet. That's, the that's election's true. still on, as far as we know. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and as Rachel Maddow tweeted this this afternoon, it's Friday. Yeah. Uh, we have a super spreader of disinformation and distraction in the White House. Yes, we do. We, sh- we do. And, and 60 million chuckleheads who think he's doing a great job. That's why our number one sponsor these days is My Primal Scream Pillow. My Primal Scream Pillow, it's just a pillow and you scream into it. And so everybody is should feel free to pause this podcast and scream into a pillow if you need to. <laughs> if you need to. We do or it. After, or during. We, <laughs> we do, do it, it all the time. Yeah. Yes. It's easier. Uh, for it's fun. Better. It's better than screaming at, you know, living living creatures, people that you're living with. Oh, cats, cats anybody. Yeah. yeah. Just go go to your room, close the door and scream into a pillow. It works Pretty well. Yeah. Uh, we had planned to do a thing this week. Just It made us laugh. Right. Uh, <laughs> and part of it is we've been having conversations, uh, not laughing, about how are we going to commemorate those who passed away from COVID uh, after all of this is over and we don't have an asshole in the White House anymore. That's true. To where there is actually proper mourning and some nobody has to think up, you know, oh, oh, by the way, we have to have an emergency press conference this afternoon. Yeah. To make me feel important and to show me trucks and motorcycles. And, you know, we don't have this idiot in the White House anymore. Uh, how are we going to commemorate what has happened? Mm-hmm. And you may you then turning it on its head because you could see I was getting low. You said. You know, we could have a tolling of the bells of all the people who shouldn't have jobs in Washington. Yeah, well, or in media. And and it, that did that did bring me out of my funk. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you and then you went ahead and found the bell sound. <laughs> I did. The mournful bell sound. And you wrote, let me see, how many of these do you have? Three you only have 10. Well, okay. Well, I figured after 10 it stopped being funny and just starts being creepy. Yeah. Creepy, well, so. I thought after 3 it stopped being funny, but you know what? Then you made funny noise, funny names for each person. I did. So I did. And, you really and worked on this. This is well, not really. I just pulled this out of my ass. And this was um <laughs> <laughs> to honor the 68 people who were just laid off at the Atlantic magazine. Well, that's it. The Atlantic yeah. laid off 68 people. And yet, mm-hmm. starting last week, I believe, David a Brooks has ago. a column at the Atlantic. Oh, uh, a month for ago, a month? I yeah, I think he's been doing this for about a month or two. But yeah. He's, he's doing that for free, right? Uh, I assume he's doing it. I assume he's doing it. He's paying them to do it. Uh, <laughs> because there is no other rational explanation why why David Brooks, who is – arguably the wrongest man in politics. We're going to talk about the meaning of the word elite later in the podcast. But just as a, sort of an unbroken record of being horribly wrong about pretty much everything, uh, has a job at NPR and at PPS and the New York Times and NBC when he wants it, and now The Atlantic. Basically right. repeating so the time same... Out. So time yeah. out. I'm going to stop you. Yes. This is an honor of the 68 people who were just laid off from The Atlantic. Yes. Who are not David Brooks. Right. We are going to pause to remember some of those who are still being paid to speak or publish their opinions. And who should definitely not be. Got it. Christopher Octavius Saliza. Joseph Claymation Scarborough. Mika Sideshow Brzezinski. 
Hugh, the cyborg sent from the future to destroy America, Hewitt. Charles Nelson Moisten before using Sykes. Margaret Maggie Handmaiden to Power Haberman. Michael Gwendolyn Gerson. Butchers Bill Crystal. Brett Jar Jar Stevens. And David fucking Brooks. All right. <laughs> so now that we've gotten that out of our system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, want, I do want to say I was, I was, I was a little depressed this week by a Twitter exchange I had where uh, I had read the entire article this week that uh, Chris Saliza wrote about, yeah, Trump's terrible, but people like him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. You've, you've now read the entire article. Congratulations. Read, you, you don't need to go check it out because that's that was the point. Mm-hmm. Trump's a terrible, awful person, but hey, people like him. And. My response was, I read this entire article, and I have one question. Has Chris Saliza ever spoken to a woman voter? And then I had a gif that said, nah. <laughs> you know, and someone replied and said, why do you read Chris Saliza? Yes. My immediate reaction was, and I almost typed it in, was for work. Mm-hmm. That... My job at Crooks and Liars is to read everything and try to digest it and figure out what's worthy of be, of rising to the top. And I thought, that doesn't answer the question for why anyone would read Chris Saliza. You hate read him. That's why you read him. Yes. Or why I read him. Uh, and maybe it's time for me to stop doing that because it's really not worthy of my time to read Chris Saliza. Well, as I mentioned in a post this week, I try to limit my um, Donald Trump – mouth shitting intake to Mm -hmm. two or three lies per day Mm -hmm. you know know, usually the biggest one that rises to the top and honestly since we started doing this podcast way back during the roosevelt administration Mm -hmm. (laughs) um it has always been our intention to give our audience or to lend our audience our insight into why things are the way they are it is extremely frustrating if you don't understand how the media works, even if you do understand, or how politics plays out at the national level, to to look at how broken things are and wonder, why the hell do they stay this way? It is so clear that one party is fucking insane and has been insane for a really long time. And, and the people that they run for office are nuts and they appeal to people who are just like them, who are also crazy. Why isn't everyone else including everyone who calls themselves a reporter out there just pointing to this and doing what John Stewart used to do, used mm-hmm. to do, which is just, Oh my God, can you believe how crazy these people are? And that's, I think the value such as it is that we lend to the national conversation from our perspective, from the middle of the Midwest, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. we can walk out our front door and talk to all of the idiots and diners you could ever want to talk to. They mm-hmm. live in our town. They are currently, mm-hmm. I believe this afternoon, protesting at the state capitol. Mm-hmm. So we we really do know what the actual, real, true Republican Party, as manifested by its members, by its voters, by its, its sincerest devotees, really is. As contrasted with the, the bullshit imaginary Republican Party that has been sold to us by people like Chris Saliza and and hundreds of people just like him in the media for decades for money, and for money, for money. Yeah. And so the, the reason I don't follow Saliza that closely, he pops up, you know, as trending every now and then I look over and everyone in the universe is saying, why the fuck is Jeff Zucker still paying this patently incompetent shithead to mm-hmm. write terrible opinions and say them on CNN, which is a very good question. And the question I have is why has he been doing it all along? If mm-hmm. this were a one-off, if this were just a mistake, yeah, everybody, ha- everybody has a bad day. Chris Saliza has been wrong always, 
and he's always been terrible. And yet there's no way to dislodge him from the media universe. I find that fascinating. That long list of people that shouldn't be working in the media is actually 10 times that long or or 100 times that long. And the question – and they and the thing that fascinates me and, and really scares me is that these people have been around for decades. They have been lodged in America's, you know, information digestive system for decades. And they've been mm-hmm. wrong for decades. And some force above my pay grade is protecting every one of them and making sure that every one of them has a huge national platform to lie to the American people. And that's what I think – brings me to Chris Silliz or any one of these people on any given day. It's well, why I want to add I want to add another perspective to that, which sure. uh, we are watching Mrs. America, which I hope everyone is watching. It's yes. really a good program. It really is. And I'm not going to provide any spoilers for it because you really should watch well uh and the, the story show. Day, the story a, I appreciate that. I would hate it if you spoiled it for me. B, we're watching it together. And C, the whole story takes place in the 1970s. So if this and spoils history it has for you, already taken place, yeah. but but there are there are things that you could spoil because Absolutely. there are fictional elements to it, and yeah. I don't want to spoil this for people. I understand. That said, there um, it has brought to mind the issue of domestic violence, mm-hmm. and it has brought to mind uh, the show has brought to mind the issue of gaslighting. And gaslighting on the right, that you will simply look at a camera, and and this is historical fact. You know, Phyllis Schlafly looked at a camera and said, those polls aren't accurate. Those polls don't accurately reflect anything, when actually they did reflect the opinions yes. of the American people about the she ERA. She just lied. She just lied. And Donald Trump is doing this exact same thing that Phyllis Schlafly did. She, he's looking at the camera, and he's manipulating the press and he's having emergency press conferences to reopen churches Mm -hmm. and it is abuse it is in in the domestic sphere when a more powerful wealthier partner and it does happen to men as well as women Mm -hmm. uh looks at the weaker or less uh affluent partner and just lies to their face that is a form of abuse and we are being abused in this country every by day. this president every, every day. day, every day. Mm-hmm. And so I feel that one of the purposes of our podcast is to be the friend who stands between the abuser and the abuser's enablers mm-hmm. and the person who is trying to stay sane during this mm-hmm. and says, no, what you're feeling and what you're hearing and how you're experiencing is real. Mm-hmm. And you don't deserve it. You deserve better than this. And what he is doing is wrong. And I will help you through this. Because what he's doing is abusive to our democracy and to each individual citizen. And I will be the friend who says, no, what Chris Saliza said is bullshit. You're, you're not imagining that it's bullshit. It is bullshit. Um, that was really eloquent. I, I don't have anything oh. to add. <laughs> okay. I, very well put. <laughs> there are supposed to be institutions to protect us right. from this behavior. That yep. The collective will of the United States Congress is supposed mm-hmm. to stand between us and a criminally incompetent, insane, racist president who mm-hmm. lies all the time and has gotten 90,000 Americans killed. But one party will not permit that protection to kick into place. They're, they're, they, will, they will not be on your side. They would rather see Americans die by the tens of thousands than say a mean word about Donald Trump. The courts are supposed to be on our side. But Brett Kavanaugh sees things otherwise. The media is supposed to mediate between the parties. It's supposed to actually stand in the breach and protect us from threats to our democracy. They're mm-hmm. siding with or rolling over for or shrugging off or saying, well, you know, both sides do it. Uh, to someone, to a party that has been a threat to us, to, that's been abusing us for decades. So all of the normal protections that are supposed to kick in, that are supposed to mm-hmm. save us, have mm-hmm. all failed. Well, and it's it's what came to my mind when Phyllis Schlafly over and over and over again says, you know, it's not the man's fault that the woman is being abused at, at right. the workplace. Right. It's nope. not the husband's fault that the wife feels oppressed by housework. 
no virtuous woman would ever be abused in that way. Right. It must be right. those women are fallen, are sinful. Right. That's right. the problem. That's right. the that's always the problem. It's always the victim's problem. Right. And the entire story of Mrs. America, which is which really is spectacular. If the casting is wonderful, it's just extremely well done. Um, takes place during the mid seventies. And during this period, we we see the modern conservative movement take shape. Mm-hmm. Would that be fair to say? Well, and the last episode is called Reagan. Yeah. But, so but now see, you know. Now you know everything you need to know about where what it's leading up to. But exactly. we see yeah. Phyllis Schlafly. We see uh, Jesse Helms. We hear about a guy named uh, Jerry Falwell, um, et cetera, et cetera. The, all, and all of the pieces are there. All of the pieces of the modern conservative movement are the groundwork. As Phyllis Schlafly says, the groundwork for the modern conservative movement was laid by Barry Goldwater. It didn't die. It, it's all there. So this is in the mid-70s when, when the conservatism, as we know it now, the, the racist, misogynist, lying, the liberal media are a bunch of communists who hate America conservatism right, right. was locked into place. And if you just look up on Wikipedia – you know, I, I was on a on a field trip in my junior high school when all this was going on. I literally was in Washington do, uh, during a junior high field trip, uh, taking pictures of the Watergate Hotel, which is very exciting, and uh, the Smithsonian. But I was in, in I was in junior high as this was happening. And if you go and look it up, Bill Crystal was in his early twenties at this time. David Brooks was fourteen. Joe Scarborough was thirteen. Rick Wilson was twelve. Michael Gerson was twelve ish in that range there. So the conservative movement that these people swear just went off the rails like five minutes ago has been the conservative movement of hate and rage and racism and misogyny and lying for their entire adult life. That's, what, that's the thing I, I really have to stress. Everyone who is telling you that they had no idea the Republican Party was this bad is lying. Or they're just completely fucking incompetent when it comes to speaking for the Republican Party, which means they shouldn't have a job anywhere because that's really their only job. So they grew up with the Falwell Party and the Pat Buchanan Party and the Rush Limbaugh Party as the default setting for the right. And they didn't do shit about it until Donald Trump came along. And then well, they and that's their- why I'd like you to to segue into reading a letter from our listener Bob, if you would. I'd be happy right on to. topic. Yes, it's um from alert listener Bob, who dropped me a note, literally as I was writing a post about the subject that he wrote me about. So I just laughed my ass off for a couple of seconds. Um, and here's what uh, alert listener Bob wrote. Um, they have this is the uh, the bulwark, never Trump bulwark. Um, uh the saviors of democracy. They have published a whole book about the never Trumpers quote, never Trump, the revolt of the conservative elites, hardcover May 11th, uh, 2020 by Robert P. Selden and Stephen M. Tellis, in which they argue quote, that right wing elites are essential to sustaining democracy by restraining and marginalizing extremists on their own side and persuading liberals or independents. The bulwark goes on. Never Trumpers are the future of American conservatism. This is from today, May twenty second. It's such a reach around, back and forth. It it is. It, and but the, but they have a book, and they have a book yeah. written by two scholars, and it's going to be published, and it's going to be all that tells over. Them they are awesome. And and the media that the Chris Siliza media, the Michael Gerson media, the David Rooks media will take take this book and hold it up as a shining example of what's good about the right and how the right can be saved and the right can be salvaged, and. As alert reader goes on to say, which is pretty damn rich in and of itself. But from what I can see, the book consists of the usual suspects saying to quote you, that being me, oh, my God, the Republican Party is full of Republicans. These clowns don't mind the racist and evil policies and the huge tax cuts for the rich. What they mind is the tone. Well, to sweet hell with a lot of them. They're, they were window dressing for the fascist monster, the party that has now turned them into Gee, I'm sorry, Dr. Frankenstein, your creation turned on you. Uh, no, I don't think I'll take your advice on anything. And then he ends, thanks for helping keeping <laughs> helping keep sane by hearing someone else say, this is evil and crazy. Well, we're happy to help. Yeah. Um, it's which, published by Oxford University Press. Yeah, by the way. It's, a, it's, a, it's a real book. And uh, every now and then I circle back around to, should I just stitch together a, a you know, I've got nine, 10,000 posts out there, something like that. Should I stitch together a bunch of them and make a book out of them? And my 
practical brain says, no, it, no one's going to, no one's going to publish it. No one's going to read it. No one's going to lift it up and say, oh my God, look at this. Um, that space is, well, you taken. know, if you titled it, Charlie Sykes, the sexiest man alive. True. I can't, they I get might publish one. it. <laughs> well, well now here's, here's the thing. Uh, speaking of elites, um, we are now in the middle of the rehabilitation of Steve Schmidt. Yeah. The, the full Steve Schmidt rehabilitation is now complete. He is, and this is the Steve Schmidt who was all, who brought us Sarah Palin, who, who fell off the Republican wagon and started talking, you know, in really brusque terms about his former party, like the minute Donald Trump started to rise, which is great. Until the uh, CEO of Starbucks decided he wanted to run for president yeah. as a Republican. Well, and and then right? he, he got real excited about how the uh, Ocasio left, Ocasio left was just as bad as the Trump right. He he wallowed in both siderisms and centrism, yep. and isn't it a shame AOC how both sides are terrible? Was just as bad, just as bad, just as bad. And this was on MSNBC. This wasn't on the Blaze. This wasn't yeah, on. Right. You know, this wasn't on Breitbart. This was on liberal television, and and everyone just nodded, nodded, nodded because yeah, let's not let's not let it out of the bag that one party is to blame, and this fucker sitting in front of me brought them to the brink. And that's when Howard Schultz dragged you know enough money in front of him to make him completely abandon his pretense of principle um, and go off and w and work for Howard Schultz as a centrist third party practical candidate. Mm -hmm. And then Steve Schmidt blew up his own podcast <laughs> and burned that to the ground because uh, someone mentioned this during his podcast. Someone he, wanted him to explain his candidates yeah. stand on the economy and it was just a bridge too far. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and it was after all of this self-righteous, uh, I am, l listen to how articulate I am because I'm a speech writer. Listen to how, how well I talk about what a douchebag Donald Trump is. Give me time on TV. Okay, Steve. And then he turns around and says, but this Howard Schultz fella has got something. Maybe yeah. I'll go work for him. Like, wait a minute. No, there's two parties and you know how third parties are. And they take, no, I kind of like the money. I, I really like money and he gave me money. So I'm going to go work for him now. Like, oh, okay. So we can just forget the whole bullshit about you caring about getting rid of Trump. And yeah. then, of course, the money ran out and Howard Schultz folded on, his course, tent. He had health issues and, and yeah. we hope we don't wish anyone. No, no. Bad but, health. But, but the money he wasn't ran able out. to continue his campaign because Howard Schultz has a bad back. So right. that's the way that is. But the money and ran out. The man, the and, the, and the money for Steve Schmidt ran out. Yes. Ran out. yes. And that's when Steve Schmidt started, you know, showing up back. and MSNBC fired him. They, yeah. they walked him out the door and said, Oh, you know, if, you know, we can't have well, you're you working for a campaign. Yeah. yeah sorry. And, and then you're blowing up your own podcast. That's and, probably not a good time for you. And to everyone's be hair was on fire. Oh my God. I trusted Steve Schmidt. Oh my God. How could I have been so wrong? Oh my God. He was such a, he was such a jewel of a man. He swore so well. He hated Trump just like me. This is the drunk prom date problem, which is any wing nut who validates any liberal gets panties thrown at them because he validated me. He mm -hmm. said I was right. Would you like to come on my show now? And that's how he made a living for a while. And then, of course, it all went south. And then uh, he gets invited back on MSNBC <laughs> and starts showing up again. And I wrote about this a year ago. And I explained exactly how the career rehabilitation would work for Steve Schmidt. Because it's always this way. It's always some, some wingnut or crackpot or somebody inside the club who fucks up real bad, fucks up in a way that if it were you or me, you would never see us again, ever. We'd be gone. But it's really important, for example, for Mika Brzezinski to get Mark Halpern back on the air. Oh, yeah. He's, she's still trying. Yeah. She's still absolutely. trying. Even though he, is a, he's, he was a shitty person to begin with. And there's no redeeming features about him. He's her pet. And, yeah. she, and he's a member of the club. And it looks bad when a club member is ousted permanently. So everyone who bothered to follow politics knew that Schmidt would be back. And lo and behold, there he is. So he's back on MSNBC. So let's talk for a little bit more about elites. Well, I just want to move finish, us along. Let me just yeah. finish this one little thought, okay? Yeah. So then he shows up on the Al Franken podcast. And Al Franken asks him a bunch of questions about things. And Steve Schmidt weasels and waffles and talks about how much he loved Reagan and, and wasn't Lincoln a great guy and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it just won't acknowledge that the Republican Party has been shitty forever. And today... Steve Schmidt it will be on the Stephanie Miller Happy Hour podcast. So the the rehabilitation of Steve Schmidt, as predicted by us a year ago, is now complete. And why? I, I disagree with you mm -hmm. on one on one word that you're using. Yes. I, I think you're mis 
Miss Defining Steve Schmidt. Uh-huh. Steve Schmidt has a party trick that he does that you're right. Liberals throw their panties at because mm-hmm. it validates them. But it's a party trick. He right. eloquently destroys Donald Trump from a perspective that is not uh, liberal partisan. And I don't think that means that he's redeemed. He's given airtime and a paycheck. And sure. that, yes, that's redemption. I get it. But I don't think that uh, Al Franken and Stephanie Miller and MSNBC are necessarily, uh, well, redeeming him is a strong word. I think they're putting him on because he fills a, mo- uh, a half hour segment or, you know, the news business these days is about filling segments between advertisements. That's what it is. That's true. That's true. And he's entertaining and Mm -hmm. he, he shows up on time for the zoom call at this point. Yes. And he he, he knows how to talk in five minute increments. And this is why Newt Gingrich kept getting invited back over and over again to blame liberals for the latest atrocity Mm -hmm. is because he showed up, he was in a suit. He knew how to sit on his suit jacket to make it look squared off. Uh, his hair was combed and he could speak in sound bites that allowed them to get to the commercial on time. Mm-hmm. And I re- and if you're a known quantity and people won't change the channel when they see your face, then you're in. So th- I, th- I really think that's all it is. And there have been time. What's what's telling to me are the times when you're not invited back. And that is the Mark Halperins. And that is the. Um, Oh, who's who's the uh, Today Show guy? Matt Lauer. Matt Lauer, mm-hmm. who, tr- who who tried to redeem himself this week? Yes, he did by writing an article in uh, a on a blog mm-hmm. uh, about the person who undid his career, Ronan Farrow. Mm-hmm. You know, they're circling around Ronan Farrow right now because all these people are addicted to being on television. We have to do it, even if they've been given a contract buyout. Uh, it's amazing to me. I'm changing the subject now. But if someone gave me $26 million to not be on television anymore, <laughs> I'd take like it. Like they did with Megyn Kelly, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be trying to get on television anymore. And that just seems to be Megyn Kelly's full time job now is to try to find a way to be on somebody's show. Well, um, and here's where I, I have to disagree a little bit with you. There are 300 plus million Americans right now. Right. And right. for some reason, for it, it, it cannot be just a matter of convenience because a whole lot of those people on the list that we just donged and donged and donged are just terrible at their job, just terrible at yeah. what they do. Well, Bill Crystal is definitely one of those people who just gets it wrong all the time and right. still finds a way. Right. But right. he doesn't find a way. He is invited back. There yeah. is a place for him at the table. And the only, re- the only way you get a place for the, yourself at the table is someone reserves it for you. Someone – Someone above my pay grade thinks it's so important to have Bill Crystal at the table or Charlie Sykes at the table or Rick Wilson at the table or Matthew uh, Michael Gerson but at the table. Drift Glass, the people who employ people who are on television, uh-huh. we have already established are rather dim-witted and definitely risk-averse and care more about advertisers than they do about viewers. Mm-hmm. So that's why. I mean, and I'm not I'm not trying to simplify it to the point of – eliminating our need to talk about it mm-hmm. but well, i no, mean no the, let me, let, let's, the people let's who run msnbc are not doing this to enlighten people they can say that all day long I, but well, that's not why they're there that's not I why agree. they're in business so so here's <laughs> let, let's take the, the case you mentioned just briefly of, uh-huh. of newt gingrich right the reason newt gingrich has a public career now is that during during david gregory's reign at meet the press New Gingrich would do horrible, inexcusable, racist things, and then would be put in a penalty box for 30 days. Right, right. And then they would bring him out and put him on TV and never ask him about it. And then he'd do it again, and they'd bring him back again. And he'd do it again, and they'd bring him back again. Somewhere in that cycle, there is someone deciding that it is so fucking important that this specific lying, bomb-throwing racist must have a seat at the table no matter what he does. And mm-hmm. yeah, we have to occasionally put him in the penalty box because he's a, he's a fucking monster. He has to have a place. Bill Crystal has to have a place. And I want to know, because that's, flip a coin, man. Put anyone else on. There are, again, there are lots but of people. Anyone who can, else doesn't have an agent 
who might be representing someone else they want to have on Mm -hmm. or representing three or four of their own full-time employees. Well, then why not put Michelle Malkin on all the time? Yeah. That was an embarrassment, wasn't it? (laughs) Yeah. So Michelle Malkin was on uh, this week, and now she's basically running a white nationalist organization. But by this logic, there's no reason why she shouldn't have a spot on there. She, She should be able to go off and go to Nazi rallies and then go on Meet the Press, and no one will ask her about, hey, weren't you at a Nazi rally? Because... But that isn't how it's done. These people are very carefully selected for a reason, and it doesn't matter how horribly wrong they are. That's where we get, well, to the word elites, which is the question of what does it mean to be an elite? Because that's the title of this book. It's uh, it's a question of party elites. Now, I know- Read that book title again, Never Trump the Revolt of the Conservative Elites. Okay. So we're going to talk about elites today. Who are these- uh, Conservative elites and who are and which obviously they're the people on the bulwark who yeah. <laughs> who want to have him on their show, the authors of this book on their show, to talk about how great they are. And, so And elite is a font, you know, font size, and we understand yeah. that, and that's that's always fun. But elite means literally, dictionary wise, a select group that is superior in terms of ability or qualities to the rest of a group or society. So we know what an elite athlete is. Michael Jordan, for all of his faults, is an elite athlete. Muhammad Ali was an elite athlete. They're better than everyone else. And they stand alone in their, or nearly alone, in their excellence in a given field. I knew what the elite was when I was in high school debate. It's the people that won all the time, that were really, really good and went to nationals, and that was the elite. I know um, what elite speakers are. I know what the elite actors are. I have no idea how the word elite can apply to people who have whose alibi now is that they never had a slightest fucking clue what was going on in their own party, in their own movement for 30 years, even though that was literally their only job. Mm-hmm. And that's the part that really just floors me. And and the part that the other part that floors me is how diligent the media is, MSNBC and CNN and everyone else, how diligent they are in making sure that no one is ever put opposite Bill Crystal in a chair who will ask him that question. Right. It's not fucking well, random. But at the same time, we are going to elevate every story that that equates Donald Trump with any Democratic candidate. Right. Because we but have to have a horse race in November. No ma- Even the pandemic will mm-hmm. not stop us. From making sure there's a horse race in November. So it doesn't come down. It doesn't just come down to parting your hair and showing up to the right. meeting on time and being yeah. quotable. I because am you're protected, right? I am, right. you know, as bald as Steve Schmidt, and I have a beard like Steve Schmidt, and I, I, I flatter myself that I'm nearly as eloquent as Steve Schmidt, and I show up to my Zoom meetings on time. There's no reason in the world why I couldn't be on a Zoom meeting with Steve Schmidt, asking him the question: How the fuck did you, you notice that your party was this bad all these years? And, well, and, and then he goes, blah, blah, Lincoln, blah, blah. Right. Lincoln, no, 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 And no, he's no, done, no, right? <laughs> and and th- that's where drift glass kicks in. Because I'm like, no, 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 yeah. no, no. Yeah. That is the bullshit answer. You are supposed to be an elite expert in the field of politics. Your party has been this fucked up for 40 years. Are you, uh, were you okay with that all that time? Or or just too stupid to notice that it was bad all that time? Well, Which and is so, it? Yeah, yeah. And then we then we could have an actual interesting conversation because all of these people, even people I vigorously disagree with, all agree that something has to change. Some reckoning must come, but the reckoning is always for someone else. No one of the bulwark thinks they need to pay a price for anything. They think the people who follow Donald Trump need to pay a price because those people aren't really Republicans. They're not really conservatives. They're just Trumpists. No, they're Republicans. They're your people. You all need to learn a lesson and atone and fix this shit. And the way you fix this shit is like you fix any other problem by correctly identifying it. And they are so terrified of being named as a co-conspirator of finding their name on a list of people who fucked this country up. And I mean, Charlie Sykes was out of radio. He had retired. Why did he have to come back and write a book and say, you know, the, 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 the right lost its mind. Well, yeah, we know that it it was fully nuts when you were feeding them raw meat. Why are you involved in this at all? Why are you pretending you didn't know you sat across from these people? You were friends with these people. You put, you put Paul Ryan on the map 
And you're sitting here telling me that you're just innocent of all this. This just happened outside of your your orbit. You had no clue, et cetera. There's no other profession where this would be acceptable as an excuse. There just isn't a public excuse. And yet every day, every single day, these people are on some large media platform telling a, a gullible public that they had nothing to do with this. It wasn't their fault. That, that that they understand that those people over there aren't really Republicans, they're not really conservatives, and that the the way to save democracy is to give these fuckers more power, more and, and allow us to build the lifeboat that allows an elite group of Republicans to represent the party again. Yes, because that's how we got away with it up until Trump. And where they're going to get their voters from, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be really interesting. Because all of the all of the ninety six percent of the Republican Party are taken. They yeah. are not going to go back and vote for Jeb Bush. They yeah, want exactly. They They're, want a goon. They want a fascist to vote for. They want a, a nice, proud, out and loud racist they can vote for and feel good about being scumbag. Yeah, yeah. So, and liberals aren't going to vote for him. Democrats aren't going to vote for for Jeb Bush. So, right. where's this party going to come from if there's nobody left to vote for it? And the answer is, well, we don't need to worry about voters because we're the elite. Well, and that was the interesting part about the interview with Stuart Stevens in March with yes. uh, a African-American woman from Almond Pouring Company mm-hmm. who really laid into him. Like, you knew that this was all yes. a lie. You knew this was happening. Mm-hmm. You knew there was ra- you were going after the votes of racists, and you did it anyway. And Stuart Stevens, as you said, you he has been redeemed in your mind because he really is saying, no, this is all a lie. Yeah, it was all and a lie. The Republican Party is not redeemable. They are liars. They are lying to themselves and, and to the entire country. And, and I was it's part of over, it. And right? I was part and of I, it. And I'm responsible for it. And I take responsibility for what I did. Yeah, yeah, but but this reporter really laid into him and said, "Yeah, but you knew, and and your mea culpa isn't enough because you knew." Right. And he said, quite candidly, "I was there, and I think uh, if you <laughs> if you duct taped." Uh, Steve Schmidt to a board and made him tell the truth, gave him a truth serum, he'd say the same thing. My job was to win elections. Yes. That's it. That's it. Mm-hmm. My job was not to do policy. My job was not to make any decisions about tax cuts or, you know, abortion or anything. My job was to win elections. The way you do that is you look for voters, you find their prejudices, you find their fears, you find their loves, and you market a candidate to meet all, to check all the boxes so that they win. And once yes. they win, you know you've done a good job because they won. And that's all I cared about. Mm-hmm. And so I I think part of this is just real cynicism that we're going to have, uh, you know, bloody Bill Crystal on and not remind anyone that he was fired from this job and this job and this job because he's just incompetent and makes up stuff and doesn't know how to write, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And uh, but he plays the role of a jovial old timer in the Republican party. Who's a never Trumper. And so he, we're going to have him on because our job is to sell dick pills yes. and no people Absolutely. won't change the chance. People, who, white men <laughs> who are the market for dick pills will not change the channel. When Bill Crystal is on going, Oh, just whatever you're marketing big pharma to, gum or whatever it is you really want to get onto that commercial mm-hmm. and if they won't if you won't change the channel when bill crystal is on then he well, wins and, and so, you make a, that's a really good point and and so here's my question for the imaginary person who could answer it which is uh-huh. you which is okay fine um um rick wilson and charlie sykes and uh and uh, uh steve schmidt just pick three were mm-hmm. mercenaries they're hired mm-hmm. to win elections. They don't give mm-hmm. a shit if they tear the country apart. They don't give a shit if, if racists burn the place down. They really don't give a well, shit. And it's like any other marketing person. Right. You know what Bill Hicks says about marketing pers- yeah. people? Yeah. They don't care if the tomato sauce is full of sugar. No. And will rot your teeth and isn't doesn't really taste like tomatoes. It's 10% tomatoes. They don't give a shit. They're there to make people who want to cook with tomato sauce buy it. Hey, that, so, that hating marketing dollar is a good dollar. That's a good dollar. That hating that's marketing nice. dollar is <laughs> a good you, dollar. Fuck you. Fuck you all. But here's the thing. Let's acknowledge that that's what they are. They mm-hmm. are mercenaries who are who are good at whipping up a crowd right. of bigots and getting them to the polls. Right. Terrific. Right. Then how are they being um, – again, I'm not directing this at you. I'm directing this at you. No, I understand. Understand. How are these the people 
these mercenaries, the ones being called upon to be the moral philosophers of conservatism. You know, Blue Gal, that's a really good question for for, for the conservative movement. And yeah. I think we're like you said, and and as I have said just now, the, the test of time is: do they win elections? Yes. And if they win elections, then okay, your your cynicism was was justified. You know, it doesn't matter. We're just going to play to people's fear and racism and win elections. Then, yeah, that worked. Hey, congratulations. That worked. Yeah. And it worked with Donald Trump by the yes. skin of his teeth. Yes, it did. You know, and, and the help of Vladimir Putin. And yeah. the question is, the rest of us whose health care is threatened by this person and sanity is threatened by this person and now life or death is threatened by this per- by this person in the White House. You know, Donald Trump is losing the olds, <laughs> yes, he is. The, the ones that he didn't lose, you know, that he never had the olds that he had. He's losing. And I don't want to insult senior citizens who never would ever in a million years vote Republican, let right. alone for Trump. I'm right. talking about the people who thought, oh, he, you know, I don't like the tweeting, but he's a good guy. That good guy. Chris Eliza, right? Yeah. That Chris Eliza analysis. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, he's losing those folks because they realize he doesn't value their lives. He doesn't value the lives of their parents. If their parents are still alive and in a nursing home, he doesn't. He values the, the stock market more than he values their lives. And well, he's willing to sacrifice their lives for the stock market. And I'm old enough to remember when the corrupt Republican power broker who could not be crossed or he would destroy you and was clearly nuts and clearly evil and clearly just taking the party to hell was called Tom DeLay. Right, and, right. And back when yeah. David Brooks was wringing his hands saying, this DeLayism is so terrible. Why can't we talk <laughs> about Republicanism as it's supposed to be? And that was a very long time ago, yeah. except, you yeah. know, as as liberals, we are obliged to remember these things. And but there's always there's why didn't anybody cross Newt Gingrich? They were terrified of him. <laughs> and at the end of the day, if you're if your alibi is. I spent 30 years being terrified that the fascists running my party would kick me out of a job, then you shouldn't have that job. Yeah, you shouldn't. No one should listen to you. Well, let's let's talk about Philip Reins for just a minute. Let me talk about Philip Reins. Please, Reins. please, please, and please then do. Yeah. Philip Reins wrote an article behind a paywall at the Daily Beast about immersing himself over his ears with right wing media, including blogs, including the Blaze, including Fox, including OAN, for a week, and uh, comes out saying, "Oh, these people are terrible," and. Uh, I just want to say, you know, Media Matters and Crooks and Liars does what Philip Raines does for a week. They do it every day without a paywall. <laughs> for years, and for decades. Every Look. year, fifth, you know, Reverend Bobby at, at Media Matters does it 50 weeks a year, watches Fox and Friends as his job. And so it's not, uh, I'm not impressed particularly. And, and uh, I know that there's a whole drama about Tom Nichols and Philip Reigns and him blocking you and uh, and the Twitter thing that we don't have time for, <laughs> but no. you did, you did write about it and it's worth re- looking at driftglass.blogspot.com and reading about Philip Reigns and getting a yeah. much better analysis than I just gave it. Let's switch over to David Jolly. Cause he actually left the Republican party. Yay. Right? Yay. <laughs> He's never going back. Yay. And you know what? He goes further. He warns, and this is in a, in a uh, he, I believe he was on the Joy Reid show or, or mm-hmm. posted somewhere. It's a direct quote that most of my fellow never Trump Republicans will go right back to being a Republican when Donald Trump is gone. So he, he's telling the truth. Okay. Mm-hmm. Good for him. Telling the truth. So instead of going back to the GOP, and this is where the uh-oh starts, uh, David Jolly, everyone's favorite former Republican congressperson, is forming what is, by my count, the one millionth boutique, third way centrist pack? Mm-hmm. Jolly, and this is again quoting him directly, feels liberated by rejecting partisanship. And I'm not ready to pick up the blue jersey, if you will, the ideological blue jersey. But I do want to see something better. Nationally, we're a democratic reform organization focused on increasing competition for, wait for it, both parties. Both now, if parties. he works. If his PAC works on electing members to Congress who want to eliminate uh, what 
Moscow Mitch has done to the U.S. Senate, uh huh, I'm all for it. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. Well, here's the thing: How many Republicans are are going to run for office to undo gerrymandering? Right. And undo right. Citizens United and undo right. what Moscow mentioned. There's one party that's going to do all those things right. if they get exactly. done at all. And yep. saying that I don't want to deal with that because I'm rejecting partisanship. I don't want to pick up the New Jersey and I just want to reject partisanship. <laughs> it's fuck. Come, really, man? Really? Or if that's the case, why don't you go sit on the board of the Purple Project or the Centrist Project or a no billion of us? Or any of the other dozens of bullshit Lifeboat organizations. Yeah. They're, yep. they're already there. And they're already doing yep. no good work as far as I can tell, except they, they're wringing their hands and praying for a day when Donald Trump isn't president so that every single thing they stand for isn't highlighted as bullshit. Because what well, they stand so they for – they go back to tax cuts and deregulation and eliminating Social Security and other – Well, and it's really hard. Program, right? with, with Donald Trump – as the million watt Klieg light shining on the Republican right. Party, it's right. really hard to advance a both sides argument. I mean that yep. that if there's an endangered species under Donald Trump, it is the both siderist because it just everyone laughs at them now. But that's what they want. They want to go back to a time when you could be a Republican centrist. You know, we should have a center right and a center left party. You know, we do. It's called the Democratic Party. And, and and it's got center centrists and center right and center left. All the same people are in one party, and all the bad crazy people are in the other party. And if that's partisan, then I'm partisan. But if you can't see that, then you shouldn't be involved in politics, and you certainly shouldn't have a platform where you can persuade people or talk to large numbers of people because you don't know what you're talking about. Either you're incompetent and just refuse to see what's in front of you, or you're lying. Either way, you shouldn't be really given a platform to advance the bullshit notion that both sides are problematic and we need to work across party lines. No, we need to get rid of the Republican Party and then let the Democratic Party become two parties. That'd be fine with me. I I ache for the day, and I know you do too, when we could have arguments with conservatives, principled, decent arguments over shit, which the last time I had one of those was probably in the 80s or 90s. It's intoxicating to do that. It's it fun. Is. It's fun. But if if the response is, you know, fake news, uh, Newsweek is a Democrat organization, right. <laughs> as I got on Facebook. We can't, well, we can't ha- talk about that because you're quoting Newsweek and Newsweek is a Democrat media. And Oh, well, my gosh. And if right. the response is, the women's livers just want to rip babies out of bodies and they're all communists, which is Phyllis Schlafly, part, chapter and verse. Yeah. She lives on in the body of the Republican Party. If that's all there is over there, then there's no argument to be had. This is that we're at war, and one side has to win, and they have to lose. All right. Well, we're going to read some letters, and uh, we're so grateful to you for writing us and sending us um, apportionment from your uh, Donald Trump <laughs> check. I got the Donald Trump letter on. It was you know in a. Treasury Department envelope like it was from the IRS and then you open it up and it has the White House letterhead printed on the top of it Mm because this is what Donald Trump wanted. And uh, then the back of the letters in Spanish, which I just can't wait to hear how MAGA, what MAGA thinks of that. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, some people have been able to afford to send us uh, a portion of that check uh, to support the podcast. And one particular correspondent wrote fuck Trump on the memo line yes. of his check. And we want you to know we saw that and we appreciated it. And so um, I will read his letter first. It is from Tom. He says, blue gal and drift glass. Guess who got his Trump check? I wonder how much was wasted on those. You're welcome letters from the orange treason weasel claiming credit for the work of others in this case, Congress. As usual, I'd feel kind of dirty if I kept all the extra cash myself. So in honor of our last legitimate president, Barack Obama, I'm spreading around half to people and causes I know would piss off you know who. Uh, With love, Tom. And thank you, Tom, very, very much. This one is from Melinda. Melinda writes, Dear BG and DG, What a fantastic show last week. And I don't know which one this was, (laughs) but we're so glad. (laughs) The passion and power of Drift Glass's analyses and critiques are always in evidence. But last week's performance was, as Blue Gal noted, stellar. 
and Blue Gal's compassion and piercing insight are as are of incomparable value. I love you guys. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Melinda. We love you right back. And she wrote quarantine cash on her check. So, <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling this is more of the same. You know, people are sending a portion. We we deeply appreciate it. This is a letter from AJ who sent us a Veterans for Peace card. And says, Dear DG and BG, just a little note to go along with some funds for the cause. Written while finally catching up on the last episode. And and we notice this from our stats, that people will uh, have to skip a week and come back and listen, you know, a week late. And that's just fine with us. Uh, once again, awesome work. I don't always agree with all I hear weekly, but I am 100% laser focused on the one true task of 2020, the defeat of Trump and the eradication of of crazy both siders centrist media coverage. Thank Amen. you for being one of the only truth-based hours of punditry each week. It is a crime, your show, and you personally are not invited on the other more widely broadcast pod shows. I hope you are actually having spring. Here in upstate New York, we are still waiting. We're still waiting to have a congressional representative, too. In New York 27, we'll have an election in six weeks, and we might just send a Democrat to D.C. from this gerrymandered district. His name is Nate McMurray, and I think the kind of candidate you both might like. Check him out. Okay. Uh, Since my space is nearly gone on this card, I'll close. I hope the donation helps. I'm still working, but wife is now laid off. Two college kids are back home. I pray you both stay well and please keep up the great work with warmest regards and solidarity. AJ hashtag both sides. Don't hashtag burn the lifeboats. Hashtag F the effing Yankees. (laughs) All right. That is an old school person right there. Old school, man. That's that's news blog days. Back in the day. All right. (sighs) And then um, I save this one. This is the last one. Uh, Just because sometimes... I mean, we noticed this with thank you notes, and I've said this before. Uh, you, you, perfectionism gets in the way of writing, and yeah, true. We want to send you the most perfect thank you note that we can possibly send you, and uh, some people want to send us the most perfect letter, you know, and compose something uh, because you're writing to Drift Guys and Blue Gal, and this person sent us a check with a post-it note on it and a smiley face, and it says. Hi, Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Something here for the tip jar. We love your broadcast. And it, we never miss it. And then a signature. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Suzanne and Bruce, we appreciate that so much. It's it's that simple. Um, you, you know, sometimes you don't need to say, for, sometimes you need to write four pages, but sometimes you don't. And we uh, just want you to know, don't let perfectionism get in the way of reaching out to us and letting us know you listen and you like the show. And we appreciate that. Th- that's, this is a, that's a this, very nice note. This is a trap, and we both teach writing sometimes and uh, and facilitate journalism, journaling classes sometimes. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. This is a trap we both fall into, too. I mean, Absolutely. I, I'm writing, and in my head, uh, what I'm writing is being is being read aloud on a Ken Burns documentary with violin music <laughs> in the background. And I want it yeah. for the ages. This should right. be able to be incised in granite. And I'm like, mm-hmm, that's not mm-hmm. just the right perfect word. And the other half of my brain is, Dude, shut up and hit publish already. Okay. Yeah. There's three yeah. there's three typos in here. You never catch them because your brain doesn't work that way. Just do it and move on. Just say yeah. thank you and move on. And that's well, and I've had to write, and a friend of mine has had to write letters to uh families of people who have passed away. Yes. And it's the hardest letter to write. It's the hardest thing to write a condolence letter and and say everything you want to say about the person who's passed. And the fact is we're we're getting close to a hundred thousand people in the United States who passed away, and it's just all of us are going to have some opportunity in the next five to 10 years to write to somebody yep. who's lost a family member. Yep. And that's, that's demography. And that's also this terrible virus. Mm-hmm. And as I said to this friend who was really struggling with, gosh, I don't know what to say to this person. I said, saying, I don't know what to say to you is okay. Yeah. It's okay to say, you know, there are no words for what I'm feeling for you right now, but I'm with you. There are, you know, I can't, I can't share the level of grief that I know you're experiencing, but I love you. And my hugs come at you across the miles, whatever you're feeling, if that's on the page, that's going to come across. So, and, and that's what I had to write to my sister and her family. Who's, you know, my sister's partner's daughter died of COVID. And 
I had to say, you know, I, I know there are no words for what your family's going through right now, but I love you and I'm with you. And if there's anything I can do to help you, please let me know. And sometimes that's all you can say. So just know that when you, you know, on a much lighter note, when you write thanks for the podcast on a post-it note, and I open that and see that there's a $10 check or a $5 check or whatever you can afford, I know, I feel, I feel heard and I feel appreciated. And it doesn't have to be, <laughs> right, it doesn't have to be the Gettysburg Address, right? It doesn't have to be, it ha- it's all of your letters are from the heart. And we really, uh, I mean, it's, it's tiresome now to say I, we really appreciate it. But the times really when... Do. You come home with an envelope and I open it up and, and read it to you and we laugh and we say, oh, isn't that nice? You know, and, and we share these things with each other. Uh, it warms our hearts and we really do care about you. So thank you so much. Can I, can I end on an uplifting note? Please. Um, this just came across my Twitter transom moments okay. ago. Uh, I, I've spent the last, it feels like, um, 14 hours bitching about elites and failures and the media and, and – uh, uh, um, <laughs> I would urge you to go, uh, we'll put a link up at the podcast, uh, to go see Simone Sanders, just kick the shit out of Chuck Todd today on television. Oh, good <laughs> just for her. Dragged him down a corduroy road, the wrong way through cactus. Uh, yeah, it's, a uh, it's a sight to behold. And, uh, and she's, she she's, a, she's a strong and powerful woman who knows she, how to do that. She is. And, and she, we need her. And so. she got a seat. Now, how much of a better world would it be to have her on a lot more and people she can have would, all of my potential seats? Oh, she can, <laughs> have, she can have all of mine. Just take, <laughs> take away from the column marked Bill Crystal and add yeah. to the column marked Simone Sanders. Yeah. And I'll shut up. Uh, you won't hear yeah. another, but of course that's not going to happen. But Take our victories, take our wins when we find them, and and yeah. her just stomping Chuck Todd, you know, Good. is blowing Good. his hair back across a Zoom camera is um, <laughs> something to see. Something Good to see. for her. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. As you may know by now, Donald Trump has forced the churches to reopen. Yeah. yeah. And so this week's Internet Kitty is Beelzebub. <laughs> Beelzebub is a beautiful black cat, aptly named, and, uh, you know, Donald Trump can go to hell. Uh, Beelzebub, uh, as all of our internet kitties, he eats freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Beelzebub. (laughs) (laughs) I never thought I would read those words on the podcast. You can visit Beelzebub at our Facebook page or website. You can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We do love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford, and I know times are tough. We know that. Uh, But if you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself in the drive-thru, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our full-time job. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. And that's where our snail mail address is, as we call it, uh-huh. USP, U.S. Postal Service address. Our uh, All of the information you need to donate in whatever way you want to donate to us uh, all that information is at proleftpod.com. And our, our merch is there, for goodness sake. And our merch is there. The both sides don't t-shirts and tote bags and mugs are all there. Please share our show on social media. And thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties can confirm that Diamond and Silk, together and separately, did not make Joe Biden's VP shortlist. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, loving. 
Let's forget about the wine and the crime, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020, DGBG Productions.